Hey all, if I sound a bit out of it, it's because I'm recording this on Monday afternoon while I'm still sick with a sore throat. It feels like it's coming down, but I still might sound odd. I certainly still feel odd. Because of this, even though I'm recording on Monday, you're probably not going to see the video until Tuesday. Last night, I was watching Adam and Sitch's weekly Sunday show. This time around, they were talking about Lindsay Ellis' recent video about getting cancelled, where she goes over all of the cancelable things she's done and gives her side of each story. As always, Adam and Sitch do a great job at picking apart the train wreck of hypocrisy and narcissism for, uh, 11 hours. But the most telling part of Lindsay's video is where she states that she cannot admit the broader left has a problem with cancelling people, because labeling the problem empowers her ideological opponents. A friend of mine named it the Beast, the name for this fear that we all live under but don't acknowledge. And over the last few years, I have had so many of my colleagues, all of them women, people of color, trans people, queer people, or some combination of the above, voice to me the constant anxiety that they live with about maybe saying something wrong that will get them on the bad side of their own communities. Every thought is a hostage situation. Is this the tweet that's going to sink me? So what do we call it? What is the name for this unspoken, unacknowledged culture of fear where we all know that one misstep can ruin our lives? This social media culture where we participate in the public shaming one day and become chained to the pillory the next. We can't even talk about it because the beast does not have a name. If we admit that this is a problem, then the right will just take it and run with it and use it to increase their own power. Same as they did with cancel. Same as they did with woke. Same as they did with fake news. If it has a name, then it has power. So it is a discussion that cannot be had. And so we do not have it. We say cancel culture doesn't exist and ignore this disease. Pretend it isn't doing real harm. In other words, the intersectionalists have cultivated the cancel culture environment. The conservatives have correctly identified it as a problem. And so the intersectionalists can't actually do anything except take it from their own audiences in order to never agree with the conservatives on anything. And yes, the intersectionalists are the ones who have cultivated cancel culture. A core point of Lindsay's video was something like, cancel culture is when your own community destroys you, which is just an absurd statement. Prominent controversial conservatives like Alex Jones or Tommy Robinson were not destroyed by their own fans, but instead by progressives screeching that their opinions were too vile to ever allow to be spoken. And then that sentiment came for regular, non-controversial conservatives, then centrists and liberals, and now it's finally affecting the big tent left, and they're not happy about it. One of Lindsay's friends, ContraPoints, pointed out on Twitter that there is a parallel between what she calls Diet Nazi Internet, which is literally just the people who troll and laugh on Chan sites, Kiwi Farms, and Encyclopedia Dramatica, and Twitter woke scolds who anthologize a person's entire history of misdeeds and embarrassments. I have some sympathy for this position. Myself, Lindsay, and Contra are all old enough to have experienced our formative years offline and without social media. A lot of my embarrassing childhood and teenage moments are not immortalized as tweets or videos to be brought up a decade later to destroy my adult life, but are simply hazy memories and funny stories. Or not so funny as the case may be. However, ContraPoints believes that the parallel she draws means that cancel culture is not unique to the left. On the surface, this makes a lot of sense. It may even have been an opinion I once held at one point, but I don't think so anymore. She brings up Gamergate as her example of right-wing cancel culture, and again, on the surface, I see why. It was an angry group of gamers on the internet, yelling about how individuals within the subcultures of indie game development and games journalism were acting unethically, and therefore deserved to be out of a job. To compare, today's cancelling events are angry groups of progressives on the internet, yelling about how whatever celebrity or e-celebrity has said something bigoted, or defended the wrong person or take, or simply had an accusation, even a false one, flung at them, and therefore also deserved to be out of a job. But you can already see the difference, right? The core people involved in Gamergate actually acted unethically, and their customers responded with a consumer boycott. It's always seemed very strange to me that a rapidly anti-capitalist political camp would turn around and decry large swaths of normal, everyday, dare I say proletariat people engaging in a consumer boycott against the owners of capital, and instead actually side with those owners. Meanwhile, most of today's cancel events don't seem to involve any kind of actual Gamergate-style ethical breaches. Piers Morgan was cancelled when he said that Meghan Markle's son couldn't become a prince not due to racism, but due to the current laws of succession. Gina Carano was cancelled for a long list of tiny reasons regarding pronouns and tweets and whatever, but the big one was saying that today's mob mentality went too far, comparing it to Nazi Germany. 
Tucker Carlson seems to face a cancelling event once a year like clockwork. Dr. Seuss was cancelled over the content of books that are considered racist today, but were acceptable for the time period. And funnily enough, Disney has not been cancelled for the same thing regarding their old movies. Gab and Parlor were cancelled after the January 6th Capitol riots, despite Facebook being a larger hub for the organization of that event. Troy Levitt was invited to resign from his job working on the game Hogwarts Legacy when people noticed he ran an anti-SJW YouTube channel back in the day. Keemstar, PewDiePie, and JonTron have all been cancelled multiple times. The list goes on, from Hollywood celebrities, to online personalities, to companies and products. The difference between these events and Gamergate is clear to me. These don't seem to involve any legal or ethical breaches, but rather differences of opinion over politics or philosophy or even art. I think this is why the pro-Jared situation felt different than your usual cancelling event, even though pro-Jared was obviously innocent in the end, and it's because he was actually accused of something that, if it were true, would have been a real violation, and not something trumped up. Compare these two scenarios. In the first, a small YouTuber named Trillium, with less than 5,000 subs, makes a video about how she doesn't like The Last of Us Part 2. Her take goes viral with both fans of Naughty Dog and progressives plugged into the culture war, and she catches so much flack that people dox her and she deletes her online presence and goes into hiding. In the second, Asmongold on stream goes over the blatant racism of one of Blizzard Entertainment's writers, Madeline Rue, while noticing that she may be related to the senior vice president of HR. His fans notice a surprising amount of similar racism and sexism from other writers at Blizzard. In the first scenario, a person has an opinion about something innocuous that runs counter to the mainline progressive narrative, and they get harassed for it by a crowd of people largely unrelated to them. In the second scenario, a progressive within a position of power acts unethically and hypocritically, and their own consumer base shines a light on their bad behavior. The first scenario is cancel culture, because it is done by people wholly unrelated to the target for completely asinine reasons. The second scenario is accountability, because it's done by the people who consume the product created by the target, holding the belief that their own subculture is being weaponized against them by those in power. Of course, if you're a progressive, there seems to be all the motivation in the world to conflate these two things. A non-lefty gets cancelled for ridiculous reasons? It's just consequence culture. It's accountability. You did something bad and deserve it for sure. A lefty gets held accountable for their own shitty actions? Oh no, cancel culture's at it again. I'm not at fault, it's those evil goober gators. But muddying the waters between these two things obscures their most important difference. While it's true that consequence culture, that accountability, that the consumer boycott is apolitical, as ContraPoints pointed out, cancel culture itself is specifically a product of progressivism. This is why whenever somebody is canceled over something benign, like both Lindsay Ellis and ContraPoints have been, it is always by their own progressive audiences. And in fact, whenever anybody of any political persuasion is cancelled over something benign, it's always by a progressive mob. The people who wish to wield the justice of the mob against anybody on a whim have purposefully blurred the boundaries between cancelling events and consumer boycotts. And with that merger now complete, you need not think about anything other than the politics of the parties involved. For example, was it cancel culture going too far, or just accountability in action, when Jimmy Galligan held onto a three second clip of a white teenage girl saying the n-word while singing along to a song, only to finally release it years later when that girl was an adult in order to foul her university admissions? Well, in the mindset of the progressive, we only need to understand the target's politics to know if it was deserved, or even worse, her race or gender. Now that we've stripped away the meaningful difference between cancelling events and consumer boycotts, tribalism is all we have left. You can apply this framework to any event. Why did Justin Trudeau get away with blackface? Why did Sarah Jong not immediately lose her journalist job over old racist tweets, when Alexi McCammond lost hers over her old racist tweets? Why did a literary agent get fired solely over owning a parlor account? The answer to each of these questions is, what tribe are you a part of? The problem with countering this type of conflation is that it can be really hard to discern the truth based on who's presenting the evidence. This video went viral last week, and it's an excellent example of what I mean. Tariq Wash Yoaz Nasheed posted, a white Holiday Inn Express worker has a nervous breakdown after he got scolded by a black customer because of a mistake in the reservation system. Because you all made a mistake? Not really, no. So you want to get mad and hit the computer because you made a mistake? Because your company made a mistake? You want to take it out on me? I'm not taking it out on you. So why did you get mad and hit the computer? Why did you get mad and hit the computer? Because I have I'm sure you're on camera, right? Yeah, I am. I'm sure you're on camera. So this is the type of people they have working here.
Wow. You gotta be kidding me. Wow. And a lot of people lost it on Tariq for posting what is clearly a man having a nervous breakdown and making it about race. But a lot of people is not everybody. Somebody make sure this white boy don't have a gun. Would he have done that if the man wasn't black? He would have fixed the issue and moved on, like he probably did countless of times before then. Black people are never afforded the grace of a public mental health meltdown. This man has mental health issues and shouldn't be in a public facing job. The black man who filmed feared for his safety. Ah, no, hold on a second guys. Uh, I'm sick, I'm trying to record this video, and somebody royally fucked up the SFO Minecraft server. I was mid-recording and I had to go fix it, it took like an hour. This is gonna be a, a big audio file. If you didn't know we had a community Minecraft server, well now you do. Join us sometime. In any case, from the progressive BIPOC lens, Tariq and the others are absolutely correct. This is a black person fearing for their lives, and recording a potential white aggressor's meltdown. However, from the progressive, ableist, and queer-centric lens, all of these people objecting to Tariq Nasheed are absolutely right too. This is a neuroatypical gay man being harassed by a privileged, healthy, straight oppressor who is about to use his own oppression to ruin his life. But neither of these are the correct lens to use. They each filter out important information. The first lens implies that if the races of the person recording the video and the hotel clerk were reversed, then suddenly it would be objectionable to record him. And Tariq would absolutely say so if that were the case. The second lens implies that it would be totally fine to cancel this person if he didn't have his mental problems. And yes, this is exactly how it's coming off to progressives who find themselves prioritizing race and losing that clash on this event. If he was just a normal white guy who wasn't mentally retarded or a gay freak or whatever, nobody would give a fuck. He would lose his job and everyone would agree with Tariq. It is the use of these lenses that turns everything into a premeditated, calculated strike with no room for the actual humanity of the people involved. Is no one gonna point out that the reason the guy smashed the computer on his head is because he knew that the black guy was trying to frame him as a racist and destroy his life? That's the new strategy. If you can't defend yourself with words, just have an autistic mental breakdown. The quartering started up a GoFundMe in support of this guy, which has gained a lot of traction, but judging by his Reddit post history, he doesn't seem to want it. Since the event, he's been slowly spiraling into worse and worse depression, with the family of the guy who recorded him harassing him at his workplace, which he quit, as well as his home, threatening his life. And because legitimate consumer boycott has been merged with cancel culture, the only tool the progressive has left to judge whether or not this event was justice served or justice aborted is which progressive lens you think it's more appropriate to look through. Meanwhile, the individualist position rejects all of these lenses and simply says treat people like individuals. It doesn't matter if one's black and one's white. It doesn't matter if one has mental problems and the other doesn't. I mean, it might matter in terms of understanding why he had that kind of reaction, but it doesn't matter in terms of understanding whether or not he deserves to be dragged through the mud. And yes, for the progressive, it most certainly comes down to this type of tribalism rather than any actual interest in real wrongdoing. One can be strongly against a cancel culture and still support the cancellation of dangerous psychopaths. And who defines the psychopaths, Sam Harris? Would that be the progressives by any chance? And again, yes, the muddying effect I've been describing is real. Cancel culture in 2020 is exactly what political correctness was in 1990. It's a thing conservatives made up so they can pretend they are speaking truth to power and fighting for free speech when they are actually just being awful people. No, what's actually happening is that when people speak truth to your power, when they advocate for speech you don't like, the only thing you can do is conflate them with the idea of just being awful. Honestly, what a lot of this behavior stems from is simple narcissism. If you watch Lindsay Ellis' Hour 40 non-apology video, you can clearly see it. The whole thing is filled with digs and backstabs and humble brags and fake-ass apologies. These are people who view themselves as the hero while simultaneously celebrating the shutting down of all opinions that go against them, the firing of all people who do not march in lockstep with them, and the subversion of all organizations and platforms to suit their needs. These are people who shriek bloody murder about the injustices of cancel culture when their Patreon is raking in 18,000 a month rather than the 20,000 they're accustomed to. All the while gleefully getting the assistant manager at Pay Less Shoes fired because he's sexist for posting on his private Twitter account that he doesn't like the new Star Wars movies. If progressives actually thought anybody I've talked about in this video has done anything wrong, and they were actually interested in justice, they would talk to them. But it's not about peace and understanding, it's about control and dominance. 
Progressives are pushing an anti-hierarchy philosophy, and when your average rank and file progressive turns on the progressives at the top of the hierarchy, they're shocked it finally came for them. Here's where we are now. Your average person is no longer comfortable sharing their political views. This is not a good turn of events. Civil society survives when disagreements happen at the ballot box and during a debate. It crumbles when they happen in the streets and on the battlefield. But that is the future we're moving towards. A growing chorus of people who have survived the many repressive governments around the world have all been saying that what they see in cancel culture is the beginnings of a totalitarian regime. It's no surprise to me, therefore, that ContraPoints went on a podcast recently to advocate for Maoist-style struggle sessions, where a person accused goes through a revolutionary tribunal where they get raked over the coals by those who object to their past behavior, so that they may come out the other side as a redeemed comrade. It feels like there is a cultural void when it comes to what penance and absolution looks like. The options are excommunication from society or no consequences whatsoever. Yeah, I've actually had the thought that it would it'd be better to have something like internet panels of restorative justice. Yes. And I know that's, that probably sounds like super dystopian, but I would argue it's way less dystopian <laughs> than what we currently have. Like, but if people who had, you know, so suppose someone's going through a canceling event. I think we all know what that means at this point, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, the tweet is trending. We're talking about it, right? If we were able to kind of have, I don't know, like a live stream or something mm. with a peacekeeper or mediator where like the person who is accused is sort of able to sort of, I don't know, face the people, the group of people that's maybe hurt by this and like able to kind of try to, to understand where each other is coming from. If we can yeah. see if this, you know, get, give some, yeah. so get, try to get some sense for if the person who's, you know, who did blackface 20 years ago has actually moved on or not. Do they understand why this is bad? Like is, you know, have they done things in the time sense that would sort of be the opposite values of that in action? It's an online yeah. revolutionary tribunal. Yeah, and you know we'll <laughs> have we'll have judges. <laughs> powdered wigs. And, we got to bring yes, back the powdered we, wigs. We, we can yeah. have powdered yeah. wigs. We can, we can <laughs> do a little camp. Uh, maybe it's like Perth? the three judges are all dressed differently, and one has a powdered wig, and another <laughs> yeah. is wearing the the Mao outfit. The the, exactly, <laughs> struggle session outfit. This is the end point of the progressives' cancel culture. They are fundamentally hypocritical in that they want it to affect everybody except themselves. However, now that they're learning that it cannot not affect them. They want to implement a dystopian apology process where the progressive gets to self-flagellate for the benefit of all, for the crime of making a rape joke in 2009. And as for the unrepentant, what, do they get executed? I mean, they did in Maoist China, they did during the French Revolution, but that's not going to happen now, at least not online. Are they getting deleted off the internet? Maybe, but alt tech is a thing now. Sarah Silverman properly identified that because progressives don't offer a path to redemption, regular people are simply abandoning the progressive idea of justice and finding kinship elsewhere. That's what Bitshoot and Minds and Parlor are. Part of what I've been talking about here can be more properly explained in the article Beating Back Cancel Culture by Pedro Domingos. In it, he outlines a list of things you should do during a canceling event. Find your friends, pick your battles, know what to expect, don't back down. Don't let them make it about you. Hold the moral high ground. Mock them mercilessly. Don't let their narrative outrun yours. Goad them into overreaching. Turn their weapons against them. Use the courts. Bring administrators around. Don't antagonize, educate. Get the majority on your side. And most importantly, remember that most cancellation attempts end in failure. If you're getting canceled, you don't have to do all of these things, but you do have to do most of them. And really, the most important one is remembering that most cancellation attempts end in failure. How many times has Lindsay Ellis been canceled before she made this video? Like, 15? Most of them did nothing at all. And that is how you have to approach getting canceled. It can only truly stop you if you let it stop you. I'm not saying you're gonna come out of it unscathed. You may lose a friend or a job, and that sucks. But you can make new friends or land new jobs. But if you capitulate to them, you only make the losses more severe. Or even worse, you begin to inflict them on yourself. When I look at Domingo's list, I realize it's the complete opposite vision of what ContraPoints espoused in that podcast with her struggle sessions. The point of a struggle session is to lose to the mob so that you can be taught the lesson you need to learn. The point of Domingo's list is to oppose the mob because you don't agree there's anything that they can teach you. And you know, as dystopian as it sounds, part of me loves the idea of attending an internet struggle session. 
I would not mind the opportunity to tell all of these self-important losers off to their face, to completely reject their conception of justice, to let them know that I do not regret any of my past actions, and to shove their opportunities of forgiveness up their cloacas. I have no need to be absolved of my crimes by progressives, Vosh style, because I have not committed any crimes at all. Yeah, I do just want the opportunity to shit on the whole thing. But talking seriously, no, internet struggle sessions are an awful dystopian idea from a group of people who cannot conceive of actually living in freedom. Cancel culture is just rebranded witch hunting, and it's one repressive practice of many that progressives have brought back from our past. Racism and sexism are okay again, if it's directed towards white men. Sexuality is bad again, not because of the conservative calling it ungodly, but the progressive calling it objectifying. Stalking is okay again, as long as you call it stanning. Being gay or trans is a choice again, because the idea of immutable characteristics is now biological essentialism. Fighting fascism is now simply making a snarky post online, it's somebody your favorite YouTuber said is a Nazi. And when you hit that send button, it's almost like being there on D-Day. Freedom of expression is encouraged, but only if living your best life means saying and doing things that progressives approve of. Every single problem I've listed off is a progressive problem. And really, there's no progress in it. These are all rollbacks, not advancements. Cancel culture, as well as ContraPoints' as a struggle session solution for it, are just modern day drumhead trials. There's no justice here, nothing's improved. Nobody's wrongs are righted. Nobody deserves the punishments they get. So when the mob comes for you, tell them to fuck off. Even if they're right, tell them to fuck off. Because you can privately take whatever legitimate criticism some of them may have without allowing them to destroy you. Don't be so pig-headed to assume that any person who speaks against you is out to destroy you. That's a fast track to Spooniville. But also don't let them use their honest attempt to point out a problem as a vector to actually harm you either. This is advice that the progressive will never truly be able to accept. Because in blurring the boundaries between unjust cancellation and just accountability, they've also blurred the boundaries between those who would point out their blind spots and those who would attempt to destroy them. They have made it so that they can never again self-improve through a friend's honest criticism, because that friend now appears to them as the villain moving in for the kill. But here, we're individualists, not progressives. And that problem isn't our problem. We know the difference between a friend's criticism and an enemy's attack, just as we know the difference between the consequences of a real mistake and angry people filling up our mentions over something that we still think is correct. It doesn't matter if they appeal to the authority of numbers, of their large mob against your lone opinion. They may derisively call you protagonist brain, but that's only because they're all NPCs. It doesn't matter if they appeal to the correct opinion or the proper politics. They will call you Nazi or fascist or alt-right or whatever else solely out of desperation. It might matter if they manage to worm their way into your IRL circles, if they call your job or your family or your partner. It's certainly possible to lose those things, and that's no joke. But if you remain on good terms with them, if you let them know what's happening, if you are a good, honest, trustworthy person, they will side with their experience of you over what a random online person says any day. And if they don't, they probably weren't good for you in any case. Point is, while the overbearing officer might say, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, to justify the state's unwarranted surveillance, the liberty-focused argument regarding cancel culture is actually this saying's inverse. If you have nothing to fear, then you have nothing to hide. If you are true in your convictions, then show them no fear. When the angry mob of people comes for you, and you're certain you've done no wrong, then anchor yourself right beside the truth and weather the storm. Like all storms, it will pass. Thank you for watching, my friends. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to share it around and do all of the other algorithm-positive stuff that the YouTube engagement metrics like. I don't know. Sub for more, or hit up my Patreon or Subscribestar if you want to keep it coming. And be sure to stick around, because I'm putting up a new video every single day. So, I'll see you tomorrow. I love you.